Thank you very much. Yes, I think this is uh, suit very well with all the the um, topics that have been addressed by the previous speaker. Actually, I will try. It's a complex scenario, so I will try to follow some kind of uh, schematic uh, flow that is actually we have a number of different drugs that we can use whenever we have a bleeding patients in cardiac surgery and actually we have a number of different targets coming from very very simple to very complex uh, targets and scenarios actually this seem, seems a simple thing we just have to give protamin to antagonize heparin but we know very well that the protamin dose is something not that very well defined because of course if we if we have an inadequate heparin antagonization then we will have bleeding but if we have excessive protamin this will lead to bleeding as well and actually my personal feeling is that the standard ACT is not a valuable test for addressing the protamin dose. I've seen dozens of patients with an ACT back to properties that have still heparin on board. And why this could happen? Uh, well, let's look at, at this. In any case, we have a possible mechanism of protamin anticoagulant effect. There's a number of reasons why protamin, if, if it doesn't find heparin, then may result in an anticoagulant effect. And actually, what, I, what I'm personally doing is trying to look at a more sophisticated tests whenever I have to, to really set the heparin dose and the protamin dose. And one of these is the simple tag. I mean, this is a typical case where we have a bleeding patient, ACT is back to normal, but if you do the tag with a standard <coughs> cup or heparin ACE cup, then you can see easily that there is still heparin on board. So very simple, but I think the first thing that we should think about is do we have antagonized correctly heparin? Uh, then we have a very complex scenario that is dealing with thrombin generation. You know, thrombin generation is a very important issue. And actually, uh, I would like to have this kind of test as a point of care test, but we are presently lacking. This is a standard of thrombin generation core. You have fresh frozen, you have plasma, you have tissue factor that is powerful, of course. And in, in the clinical scenario, it's probably in cardiac surgery, it's the most powerful thrombin generator. Then you look at what's going on in terms, of, in terms of thrombin generation, you have this kind of setting, and then you have the endogenous thrombin potential. That is a marker of the ability of the patient to generate thrombin. Unfortunately, we can deal, we can use this as a point of care test, absolutely. We can, uh, we know that there are patients with a strong thrombin generation potential, otherwise, other ones with a, a lower degree. We can probably indirectly assess the thrombin generation ability of the patient using these two point of care tests. Uh, actually, you know, TAG and TAM are uh, more or less the same thing. It's a matter of different companies, but the, the, the mechanism that, that of working is more or less the same. In the tag analysis, we have the R time or reaction time. That is actually the time that is, that it is spent by the blood for sh shifting from the liquid phase to the initial solid phase. It, it's this one, okay? And if you have a prolonged R time, this is a warfare in patient. So you have a normal, uh, a normal MA trait, but a prolonged R time. This is an indirect marker of decreased thrombin generation. And actually there is even an algorithm within the text that is more or less trying to replicate a thrombin generation curve. But beware of this. This is just a mathematical uh, derivation of various parameters. This is not a true thrombin generation. So uh, actually we should rely on this simply on the, on the length of, of the R time because this is not a direct measurement, it's just a mathematically derived. But you can have some numbers from the tag that are more or less resembling the one from a thrombin generation curve. This again is a warfarin patient after 36 hours after warfarin treatment. And if you do the same with the Rotem, actually it's just a matter of changing the name. This is a CT time and it is a clot for the clotting time and actually represent more or less the same thing. Then with the Rotem, you can do even more sophisticated tests, let's say the ex exploring the extrinsic and the intrinsic coagulation pathway. And you can do things that we will see farther on on uh, fibrino functional fibrinogen or fibrinogen contribution to the clot firmness. 
So if you have a bleeding patient after protamine and you see that there is no more heparin on board and there is a prolonged heart time, so maybe this patient is in need for coagulation factors. I totally agree. Fresh frozen plasma should be totally abandoned in the scenario of cardiac surgery. But in any case, there are patients that are in need for coagulation factors and not just for fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is very important. It's the most important in my feeling. But a- anyway, if we look at standard CAVG patients, of course, the decreasing coagulation factor is not that important as to require a replacement with uh, prothrombin complexes and, uh, of course, not with a fresh frozen plasma. But there are subset of patient population that are actually consuming a lot of coagulation factors. Let's, let's think about uh, acute aortic dissection. Think about a uh, grown-up congenital heart patient that they have a, an acquired liver dysfunction due to the blast ignition uh, on the venous side. Let's think about uh, chronic liver disease. So that's a number. It, and even pediatric patients, they may suffer from uh, because they have a very long, prolonged pump time. So there are patients that probably can show this kind of behavior. And if you simply provide, and th- this is a bleeding patient, you, you just give some prothrombin complexes and then you are back to normal. Uh, of course, you can address the problem of thrombin generation by simply exerting a bypass of all the coagulation factors. You just give recombinant factor 7a. I know there is Revis that will address recombinant factor 7a in detail, so I don't want to, to spend that much time, but simply again demonstrate that if you are giving uh, Novo 7, then you will, in a bleeding patient with a prolonged heart time, then you will see the are times that is back to normal. Uh, actually, what we know from the stu- study of Ravia, I was one of the investigators, I collected some of the data, is that in any case it is effective, even if we have some concerns about uh, thrombotic complication. Then there is uh, another very important thing, it's uh, clot formation, clot firmness, clot stability. And actually, this has something to do with fibrinogen and factor 13. Fibrinogen has been addressed by the previous presentation. It's a very important point. I mean, y- we know that after thrombin formation, then we have the shift from fibrinogen to fibrin and then to, let's say, first of all, to uh, uh, monomers and then to polymerization through factor 13. And actually, there's a great deal of information that is telling us that fibrinogen is the first and most important coagulation factor that is consumed uh, in different settings of bleeding patients, of course in trauma patients, but in cardiac surgery as well. And there is some kind of correlation between the post-operative bleeding in cardiac surgery and the, the, um, the concentration of fibrinogen. What we are actually lacking is a clear information about what is or should be the uh, target value of fibrinogen that we should aim to reach if we want to treat the fibrinogen deficiency. We don't know, actually. Uh, we know where we can find fibrinogen. We can find fibrinogen in fresh frozen plasma, but we need a lot. I mean, we need probably something like two liters of, of, of fresh frozen plasma to, to get enough fibrinogen to correct uh, a fibrinogen and acquire fibrinogen deficiency. We have fibrinogen in cryoprecipitates, and of course we have much more fibrinogen in cryoprecipitates. And of course we have fibrinogen concentrates that are not, c- I know there are countries where fibrinogen is approved for acquired bleeding. Actually, German, Austria, uh, Central Europe, uh, there are other ones like UK where I know that it is an off-label indication. Uh, actually, I think if you are lacking fibrinogen, to me the, the most reasonable thing is providing directly fibrinogen. But of course, cryoprecipitates are a, a possibility. Uh, that's an important point. Wh- how can we measure fibrinogen? Of course, we have the closest say. I totally agree. Thromboelastography and th- thromboelastometry uh, we require some standard of, of uh, care. We, we require to be sure that the, the number are uh, reliable. But I'm sure that we can agree that close assay, if you use different reagents and different devices and different hospitals, you can find out very different results. Uh, and we did a couple of studies with Christina Solomon on this, and so we are quite sure that this is not that much a, stand- a gold standard for fibrinogen measurement. 
So again, with thromboelastography and thromboelastometry, we can actually uh, have some kind of information about the fibrinogen contribution to clot firmness. You know that the, the normally, the if you look at the, well, let's uh, go back to a normal tag. This one is clot firmness. This is a combination of the contribution of fibrin and platelets. So if we want to really understand how much fibrinogen is contributing, so we must get rid of the platelet contribution. And we can do this in different ways with thromboelastography or thromboelastometry. With thromboelastography, we just have to add uh, a GP2B3A inhibitor, so we get rid of the contribution of platelet, and this is the contribution of fibrinogen to the clot firmness. In thromboelastometry, we do something really similar, but we use cytokylosin D, D that is another way for, for uh, blunting the platelet contribution to the clot firmness. Uh, <coughs> we, we know that fibrinogen in cardiac surgery is important in some settings. Again, I think that if we look at standard catch patients, norm routine patients, I have not been using fibrinogen in Italy for 20 years, so and my patients were not bleeding that much. But again, there are patients that may experience very, very low levels of fibrinogen, and these are patients that are experiencing very complex operation. For instance, in this pilot study, this was ascending aorta surgery. That is a good model for coagulation factors consumption. And in this model, uh, Ryan Mayer could demonstrate that patients that were treated with fibrinogen actually had a reduced need for blood transfusion. So I think it's, uh, it's uh, certainly something that we should keep in mind. Uh, then there is the factor 13 story. You know, factor 13 actually uh, could have a role because there, there's this study that has been, no, not this one, but in this study, Corti could demonstrate that the bleeding patient, they actually had a decreased factor 13 activity after cardiac surgery. And this one, that is a very important one, is the one that has been mentioned before. Uh, the only two factors that were associated with uh, an increased bleeding after cardiac surgery were low levels of fibrinogen and low levels of factor 13. So there was some kind of rationale that was inducing people to explore if fibrinogen, uh, factor 13 replacement could play a role in limiting blood loss and transfusion. So we did this study that is presently under consideration of circulation. But I can tell you that due to a number of reasons, we explore two different uh, dose of fiber of uh, factor 13. This was a control group, this those one, those two. We could absolutely uh, restore normal values of factor 13, but the, the primary endpoint of this study was transfusion avoidance, and I can tell you that we transfuse exactly the same amount of patients in the free group. So actually, it's the, the most perfect negative study in the world. So <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't think that, that at present there is a big role for uh, factor 13, but an important side information was that despite the fact that we were having exactly the same transfusion protocol exactly the same and we have an acceptable rate of protocol violation actually this was transfusion rate in the different institutions so we have someone transfusing 80 percent someone this is my institution actually transfusing 25 percent or something like that someone even transfusing less than 10 percent and in a multivariable analysis the only predictor of being transfused is the hospital where you are operated. This is the only, the only predictor. Because, the surgeon. yeah, the surgeon of, well, well yeah, that, I don't think this has that much to do with, uh, with surgery. I think it's, as you mentioned, it's patient blood management that is, that is probably what is playing a role. But this is an inform, important side information from the study. Uh, Platelet aggregation problem. Uh, you know, the only drug that has been hypothesized to act on platelet aggregation is DDAVP, desmopression. And actually, we know very well, and in the future, this will be probably even worse, that patients treated with tienopyridines, clopidogrel, prasugrel, if we are operating them, they will bleed more. 
And if you look at the guidelines, someone is telling you three days, someone is telling you five days. We don't know how many are actually resistant to clopidogrel. So it's, it's still a problem. And the suggestion is why don't we use point of care test? Uh, a possibility is this is called tag platelet mapping. It works, but it is quite complex. You have to inhibit platelet function at all, then you have to stimulate with what you want to, to address. You can do this with ADP if you want to explore tienopyridines. You can do this, and this is a case of a, of a very, very low uh, activity of the tienopyridines. You can explore aspirin. You can do whatever you want, but it's quite a tricky way. Uh, I pref I, I'm routinely using this kind of uh, aggregometry that is called multiplay, and so you seem it's very fast. It takes uh, six minutes, something like that, and then by adding different kind of activators, you can explore platelet function uh, uh, under the effect of aspirin or under the effect of tienopyridines, or you simply explore the thrombin-like uh, receptor. And so this is a case of a patient that is very well anti-aggregated by aspirin, by clopidogrel, and uh, this is, these are responders, but you can have non-responders as well. Well, uh, we did a study, uh, I think a couple of years ago, where we tried to identify patients who, uh, the relationship between the um, uh, platelet aggregometry with multiplate in patients under tienopyridines treatment, clopidogrel basically, and postoperative bleeding. And actually, what we could see is that in the factors that were associated with bleeding were, of course, the, the platelet count, the length of the operation, but actually, the ADP platelet aggregation was significantly associated. And this is the normal range, the no lower normal range is about 50. So you see that there is an, an inverse relationship of bleeding and platelet function activity. We identify what we call the big bleeders. The, this is in, in our database with about 14,000 patients, the tense decilo distribution. Patients that were bleeding more than 800 milliliters. And we tried to identify which value of ADP test was associated with this. And actually, in a multivariable model, again, we could confirm that ADP-induced platelet aggregation was significantly associated with the likelihood of being a big bleeder. And the, 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 in this rock analysis, we identified a value of 31 as a cutoff value. Actually, I can tell you that whenever a patient has a value below 31, we are postponing the operation whenever it is feasible. And the great majority, as you see, of big bleeders were below this cutoff value. So, uh, Actually, the DAVP is very much debated. We don't have a very sound information about this. I can just provide you with, with a case report in a patient that was uh, submitted to an emergency carotid endarteriectomy under full clopidogrel treatment. This was a platelet mapping pre-desmopressin. You see that there is uh, a consistent decrease in platelet function. And after desmopressin, actually, we could achieve a normal platelet function. Uh, but it's just a, ca a case report, so I, I can't say anything about this. Finally, uh, this has been addressed very, very nicely in the morning session, so I, can, I don't want to tell you anything about this. <coughs> we know almost everything about tranexamic acid, a protein, and uh, it, the synthetic antifibrinolytic, they are, of course, effective. A protein is still a matter of debate. And uh, it will probably uh, come back to the market, so we will see what will happen. I, I hope anyone will never see this kind of behavior because this is associated with almost a 100% mortality. This, this the I see in a patient after massive bleeding and transfusion. So just to conclude, we, we did actually, this uh, will appear, I think, within the next months, this kind of uh, review article. And if you look at what we can actually measure with point of care tests, that's a lot of things. We have conventional tests, but their utility is probably very low in the setting of the acutely bleeding patient. Uh, we have different kind of targets that we can explore and different kind of devices that can be used. And actually, this is our personal algorithm. If I have a bleeding patient after cardiac surgery, first of all, I check if the, we still have residual heparin on board. Then we look for coagulation factors with, 
with the tegorotem and if we are in need we give prothrombin complexes then we can check for platelet function and then finally uh, of course clothfirmes tranexamic acid is given routinely to all our patients and only after following all these uh, all these uh, steps and if we still have bleeding then we can go to the surgical revision if we have refractory life-threatening bleeding and it's only in this case we are using recombinant factor 7a i can tell you that uh, with a combination of point of care test and postponing the operation addressing in a very specific way our patient my uh, surgical revision rate in the last three years is 1.8 percent that i think is it's uh, acceptably good and whenever we reopen a patient we can find some kind of surgical source of bleeding thank you very much Do we have any questions from the floor? We have time for one question, please. If, if I had one question, the recent Cochrane systematic review concluded that there is no evidence to support point of care testing as a means of improving outcomes in surgery. Now, in real terms, I don't believe that <laughs> because I just don't, because, you know, in my experience, I think they do. But what test do we have to do to prove that? What study do we have to do to prove that? Well, actually, it's a and philosophical... What, what tests yeah, do yeah. we have to do? No, I mean, I can't understand how anyone could think that the monitoring system may affect the outcome. Because monitoring is providing numbers. And between numbers and outcomes, there are the doctors. Mm -hmm. And the doctors should interpret, correctly interpret the numbers and do the right thing. If you simply think that by using point-of-care tests, then you will immediately understand. You, you may, must first of all study coagulation in the clinical context where you are applying this point of care test. If we simply try to treat the numbers, then at the end of the day we will probably even transfuse more than, 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 than required. I mean, it's like the old story of Swangans catheters and outcomes. Swangans catheters are providing us with outcomes. These are not drugs, these are monitoring tools. And between those and the outcome, there is the clinical decision-making. So I, I don't mind about this kind of review, absolutely. Yeah. 